Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mashable Reads, Mashable Social Book Club, where every month we bring together an author and members of the Mashable community to talk about great new literature. This month, we're lucky to be joined by Paula Hawkins, author of the psychological thriller The Girl on the Train. Paula, thanks so much for coming by today. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, so here to discuss The Girl on the Train, in addition to Paula, we have myself. My name is Nora Grenfell, another member of the Mashable Reads team, MJ Franklin. And we also have Ellie joining us from the UK, I believe. Thanks for coming, Ellie. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, so just to kick things off, Paula, uh, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the book, your inspiration for it, um, and sort of everything that's happened since it's been published, your reaction to how strong uh, of, a, of a reception it's had in the literary world. Right. Um, so The Girl on the Chain is a psychological thriller, as you mentioned. It's, um, the central character is Rachel, who is um, this rather lonely, bit depressed woman who travels in and out of London on the train um, at her everyday commute. And what she loves to do is look into the, the houses that she passes as she's traveling in. And she's, she's sort of become obsessed with, with a couple that she's spotted on her daily commute. And she's gone to the extent of giving them names and making up stories about them. And then one day she sees something that really shocks her. And then the following day, the, the woman, the female half of this couple goes missing. And Rachel believes that because of what she's seen, what she's witnessed on her community, she believes she holds the key to the, this, the mystery of this woman's disappearance. And then she gradually gets drawn in into this, into this whole story. And um, you asked about um, inspiration. I, I used to commute in that London, like you know, most people do, um, and I used to love doing that. Looking, I used to, my train used to go really, really close to the backs of some some houses, and I used to really love looking in and you know seeing what I could see, um, and never actually saw anything even vaguely shocking or surprising. But um, I was always, I started to sort of wonder what I would do if I did that whole sort of rear window idea. If you witness something, you know, dark, sinister. Um, and, that, and so that's where I sort of, sort of that's where the idea for the for the book came about, um, and and um, so that's been building over quite some time. Um, as for the reception, it's it's been a phenomenal and uh, overwhelming. Um, it's, I'm I was optimistic that you about the book because I'd had good feedback from my publishers and agents and those sort of people, but I, I I didn't expect I didn't expect this. That's great. Um, you know, if uh, anyone who's watching the Hangout um, from home or from work has questions for Paula, feel free to tweet them using the hashtag MASHreads, and we'll get as many answered as we can. You can also use the Q&A app on Google Hangouts, um, and we'll make sure to get your questions answered there. Um, Ellie, I am going to turn the floor over to you if you want to ask Paula your questions. I know she, she just spoke a little bit about the inspiration, so if you want to ask more about that or skip over that question, that's fine. Well, um one of my main questions was to find out more about uh, whether any of the parts of the book were actually based on the real story. And I'm not suggesting, you know, someone who's killed someone. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, whether you, you know people with drinking problems, whether they had memory loss. I read somewhere that you researched how memory loss impacts on people's lives and so on. But mm -hmm. If you could give us a bit more insight, that would be great. Um, it's it's not uh, the book isn't based on any um, on any particular real event or anything like that. But I, I did um, I did do some some research into alcoholic blackout, and I do I ha have known people who have suffered from memory loss problems as a result of drinking, and you know not being able to remember exactly what they did or where they went the night before. And I always thought that was a really terrifying idea um, that. That sort of loss of t is like a loss of time, and you could have done anything. And I have read um, stories about um, people who do quite extraordinary things when they are blacked out. So, um, so that was that was kind of part of the inspiration for it. Okay, and and did you read um, about those stories before you decided to read uh, to write the book, or was it as part of the research process? As in, did you have? And it was Friends, Sorry, uh, it was part of the it yeah. was part of the research process because mm -hmm. I'd already had this idea that I wanted to write a, a book um, where an, a, a, with an unreliable narrator and the reason for that unreliability being an alcohol problem. 
Mm -hmm. So um, that sort of came first, and then I did I did some more research on the on the whole blackout thing and all the you know, these particular stories. Okay, thank you. Um, Ellie, did you want to ask another one of your questions? Um, yes. Um, how long did it take you to write the book from start to finish, including the research and all the rewrites that needed to be done? Um, it was quite quick actually, it was about 12, 13 months um, and that's the whole thing including edits so I think I think that was pretty quick. Um, the first half I wrote really fast because I just, I got the voice in my head and it all just came out quite sort of, I was quite obsessive about it, I just wrote every day. Um, the second half was a bit slower but um, yeah, it was, it was pretty quick. Oh, brilliant. Um, Paula, what were some of the major changes that came about over those uh, 12 months of writing it? Like, what parts of the book would we uh, readers who read the final version not recognize from the initial drafts? Um, there was a there was a, set, uh, um, a sort of section in the middle where I think the pace dropped off, and my editor got me to rewrite that quite a lot and tighten that, really tighten that up. Um, I think it was it was just a bit longer, and there was a section that got repetitive. Um, so I had to do some cuts there, and also one of the changes was that Anna, because um, there's three narrators, and Rachel is the main one, but there's also Megan and Anna, and Anna's narrative I only added really quite late, I wasn't planning on um, using her at first, but then as a, as the story developed I thought it would be interesting to, to, to see um, these Rachel and Megan from Anna's perspective, so we get this kind of triangulation effect. So that was one of the things that that was that came later as well, and there were some changes to the ending, um, which I won't go into obviously, but um, some little details that I that I shifted around. Yeah, I mean, I thought the the uh, triangulation effect, uh, which I hadn't thought of in that way, but that was just brilliant. I love that part of the book um, with those three narrators. Um, MJ, mm -hmm. do you uh, want to? have a turn to ask one of your questions. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of all the narrators, um, one of my favorite perspectives was Megan. Um, I thought that she was so complex and she had so many layers that you discovered as you kept going on in the book. Um, and I was wondering how that character developed. Um, did you always intend for her to be such a secretly tortured um, figure? Um, I think I, I wanted her to have this you know, some something bad in her past, but I hadn't really completely figured it out when I started writing, and so uh, that sort of developed um, as as I was as I got into the story, and I kept thinking, oh, and yes, this could have happened to her, and then that could have happened to her. So she actually, yeah, as you say, she ends up with you know really quite a miserable background, um, but. It just, I don't know, it was one of those things that it, it developed slightly organically. Once I started writing her, I, I sort of got a feeling for the sort of person she was and the sort of life she had led up to this point. Yeah, I found that really rewarding, the difference between her real life and this fantasy life that mm. um, Rachel's constructed. That's great. That's that's good. because a lot. I mean, the the book is all about how all about perception, isn't it? How we perceive others and the judgments we make on first sight, and so that that's precisely the kind of thing I wanted to, I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, actually, another question we have. This came uh, before the hangout from Sarah, who wasn't able to join us live, but she was wondering about um, the backgrounds uh, you had constructed for the characters, specifically Tom, and she was wondering if you could speak any more to uh, Tom's background. Um, you know, we we learn more and more about him in the book, but we clearly don't learn everything. Well, the thing about that, um, some of the characters we don't, we don't because the, the, um, we don't get into all of their heads because they're only three narrators. You don't get all, all the backstory on all the characters, and I think that's quite an important way of constructing a thriller that you've got to withhold some things. So we don't maybe learn quite as much about Scott or, or Tom as we do about the women, but it's mostly because we're not hearing their voices, and I'm, you know, well, you have to conceal a little bit and um, and give a bit more. But, um, yeah, that, that's what, that some of those things are quite tricky to negotiate. Mm -hmm. um, we have another uh, question coming from um, Google Hangouts. Um, it's following up on MJ's question. Did you find it easier or more fun to write from any one particular character's voice, or did you find it easy to hop between the three? Um, I think I probably found Rachel the easiest because she was the voice I had first, and it was sort of strongest in my head, and I really knew 
she was the mo she was the most fully formed character in my head at the beginning of the book. Um, Anna was a lot of fun, I think. Um, but skipping between them, I actually found well, shifting perspective, I actually found quite difficult. That was the thing that I had to really work on. Actually, you were asking about things I had to change in the editing. I had to really work on making those voices sound distinct um, because you know you don't want to you wanted the reader to know immediately. Now they're in this woman's head, even if you know if they hadn't been told, they would know who, whose, whose eyes they were looking through. Um, so that was actually that was really tricky. Mm -hmm. um, we have another reader question, and I'm actually going to ask a question of my own beforehand. I think to give us some context for it. Um, what, who are some of your uh, favorite authors, or anyone who inspired you when you were writing *The Girl on the Train*? Well, I think my favorite authors: um, Kate Atkinson, I love um, Pat Barker. I like Cormac McCarthy. Um, in terms of crime thrillers, um, I, I like people like S.J. Watson. Um, Megan Abbott is really great. Uh, uh, Tana French is great. Gillian Flynn, um, I love. I've loved all her books. So um, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's. I do read quite a lot of crime. Quite a few psychological thrillers written by women. Um, in terms of inspiration, though, I don't. I don't. When I'm writing, I don't. I try not to read too many other crime novels because I, I get worried that you know you're going to sort of allow people's ideas and plot or plotting or characters to sort of influence you too much. So I tend to try and read completely different things or non-fiction. I like Olivia Lang's non-fiction books, for example. They're fantastic. So um, yeah, it really varies actually. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, one reader, Robin, was wondering if you could share uh, your favorite Stephen King novel or book, if you have one. Oh, well, the, um, I always tell everybody to read On Writing, which is his memoir slash, um, you know, writing guide, which I think is fantastic. I actually have it on my desk somewhere. Um, and it's, it's a really great thing to refer to if you're ever having prob you know, problems with your writing or you're, you know, you're low on confidence. It's it's just really funny and interesting and a rewarding thing to read. In terms of novels, oh, I don't I don't know. I read Carrie when I was a teenager, and that's definitely. <laughs> I don't remember being, finding it really shocking. Yeah, but I'm actually a bit of a wimp about horror, so I don't I don't I um I don't read that much horror. I tend to stick with thrillers because I get too scared with horror. Oh, well, that that is a bit surprising. Given, I mean, I was very scared during the girl on the train. Um, I think uh, Rachel's alcoholism, in particular, was frightening. Um, oh yes, well, that is in a different sort of way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it's sometimes a little bit scarier when things are realistic uh, and not full of horror. Um, Ellie, did you have one more question you wanted to ask? Yes, I, I was about to just ask actually. <laughs> Paula, have you started a new book already, or are you thinking of starting a new one? And what what would that be? Is it going to be um, a I'm, crime thriller again, or? Yeah, I'm writing a, another thriller at the moment, um, which I'm uh, well, I've, I'm sort of in the rewrite um, stage at the moment because I've yeah. I've written most of it and then I'm sort of I'm changing some things. So it's um, again it's. It has some similarities, a similar sort of tone, and it's also got female, a female narrator, two female narrators in fact, so far. And um, it's, it centers on a relationship between sisters and um, their things that happened to them in childhood and how those things have affected their lives. And it's, I'm really interested in, in memory and the way, we, the way we sort of tell stories about things that happened to us when we were younger. And then those stories sort of shape who we become. Mm -hmm. And even though those, sto those stories might not actually be completely true, they're just the way we, the stories we've always told ourselves from childhood. Yeah. So that's, sorry, that's not a very succinct uh, description, but that's kind of what it's about. Well, okay, and when do you think that this book will be out? I hope um, early next year, but I'm not sure exactly. Brilliant. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, MJ, did you want to uh, ask another one of your questions? Yes. Um, so you were talking about um, the writing process and writing a new book, but I understand you were a journalist for 15 years before turning to fiction writing. So I was wondering how journalism shaped your writing, and was that a hard transition to make? Well, I think um, 
journalism is just it's really good training um in terms of teaching you know teaching you to write to deadlines just make I was a freelance journalist for a long time I did work on staff at UK as well but freelancing you're working from home you've just got to get up and get things done without without somebody standing over you and you know so you've got to be very disciplined so all that's good and also just writing for newspapers um it I think it sort of instills a certain style in you an economy of style because you can't have too many words you know it's always about expressing yourself in the most um, effective way. I'm just going to, one second, sorry. I'm really sorry, but there's some other people coming into the house. I just want to shut the door. Um, oh, no. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, so from that point of view, I think it, um, it, it instills a discipline and um, an economy of style. And um, making the transition, um, it was... I don't know, I don't think it was that difficult. I think because I'd always written fiction on the side, even though I w wasn't having things published, I'd done things sort of for myself. So I've been kind of experimenting with fictional writing for a long time. Cool. Um, a follow-up question. That said, do you have any advice for young writers? Apart from read Stephen King. Um, <laughs> read Stephen King, be a journalist. <laughs> um, well, I mean... The same sort of advice that everyone gives: read a lot. Don't don't allow yourself to be intimidated by other by great writers. I mean, there, there there can be a way in which you read other people's books and you think, oh, I can never do this. But I think um, the more widely you read, the more you realise that there are an enormous variety of, of styles and an enormous number of them are very great. And um, and just you just got to persevere. It's it it is not easy and you have to develop a thick skin and learn how to take rejection. But um, it's, it's ultimately rewarding, and I think it's, it's rewarding even if you're not, um, if you don't become hugely successful, just because it's writing community is a nice community, um, and meeting readers and meeting, meeting other authors is always very rewarding. Great. Um, we have a question from Twitter um, from Heather. She's wondering um, if you could share your thoughts on the comparisons people have been drawing between Gone Girl and Girl on the Train, um, and if you uh, see yourself, uh, if you see any similarities there, or what you think of that comparison. Um, well, first of all, I find that um, that a very flattering comparison because I thought Gone Girl was a great book, and I um, I've said many times I loved that central character. Amy Dunn is a fantastic character. Really brilliant. Um, so, from um, obviously, I'm flattered that I can see certain similarities in that you've got this flawed um, female protagonist at the heart of the story. But they they could not be more different, really. Rachel and Amy are <laughs> chalk and cheese because Amy's you know is in control, whereas Rachel's lost control of everything. Um, obviously, there's a missing woman in it, but there are missing women in lots of books. So, I think it's more about I think it, the comparison has been drawn because of that unreliable narrator and because of that that very um, flawed um, uh, protagonist. Um, but they're 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 very different books, um, so I don't think people should go into *The Girl on the Train* expecting a similar, necessarily a particularly similar read to *Gone Girl*, although it may share some some themes and some an atmosphere, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't have that um, sort of bait and switch with the character. Rachel, no. sort of, um, I feel like you get to you get to understand her more and more, and in you humanize her as the book goes mm -hmm. on. You know, by the end, mm -hmm. she's actually very sympathetic, and even you find yourself empathizing with her. Whereas, like Amy, just becomes more and more of a monster as the yeah, author, it, whatever you want to call her. Right, actually, <laughs> they work in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I, I, I was rooting for Amy all the way. I like Amy. Yeah, me too, actually. <laughs> but uh, not sure I should have said that on the internet. But, oh well. um, uh, MJ, did you have one more question you wanted to ask? I did. This is perfect because you're talking about flawed um, characters. Um, so I noticed that all of the um, characters in this book were flawed, especially a lot of the male characters who like become more and more sinister as the book goes on. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about that. Like, why were all of the characters, especially all of the male characters, so dark and sinister? Well, I think we're we're seeing everybody. Everyone in this book is 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 no one in this book is having a particularly good time when we see them. They're all at a quite a 
a difficult period. I think Rachel in particular is at rock bottom, but they're all feeling a bit insecure either in their relationships or their situations. So they're feeling a bit precarious. Scott, for example, is is jealous and he's suspicious because Megan is you know is a bit wayward and has, has a tendency to lie to him. And Anna and Tom have this thing with Rachel basically stalking them, so they're feeling really under threat as well. So I think that every nobody's behaving particularly well, but they're all behaving maybe slightly in slightly strange ways for good reason. They all have this kind of they're all perceiving external threats to their home or their life or their relationships or something. So that's yeah. I mean, it's not a particularly um, optimistic little slice of life I'm looking at there, but it is just a um, you know. It is just a slice of life, and you could imagine that in other circumstances, these people might behave, be behaving very differently. Um, I really like that. It's such an understatement. They're not having a very good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Well, it, Ellie uh, or MJ, even if you've come up with another one, uh, were there any final questions you wanted to ask? I know we're getting close to the end of our time here. I have a quick one, if I may. Um, Paul, do you think that there will be a movie? to do with uh, the book, because um, though, yeah. the American Sniper and so on, so shall we wait for the go on the train? Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, rights have been optioned by um, DreamWorks, so they are uh, working, they have someone working on a script at the moment, and um, so hopefully we will see it eventually on the big screen, I'd really love to. Yeah, brilliant, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. That was my question as well. So. Uh, um, I know, Paula, we asked you this when you were um, uh, in our office, but could you share with us sort of your dream casting for some of the characters in the book? Oh, this is the uh, this is the question I'm terrible at answering. Um, I think um, we I talked about Michelle Williams. I thought would make a good Megan, but that's mostly based on um, a role I saw her. In a, bit of, in a particular film, and, I, and she sort of reminded me of that character. But I've, I've really struggled with casting Rachel because she, I just think she's quite difficult to cast. I think I would make a very bad casting director. <laughs> so I'm a, I, I, if anyone has any brilliant ideas, please suggest them, and I will forward them on. Who's <laughs> some I could see, is her name Emily Mortimer? She's oh, yes, yeah, that, that would be a good one, actually. Yeah, she, she was on the newsroom. I'm not sure if that's the right. Yeah, act, no. But. Someone else has mentioned her to me. Actually, you're right. She would. She would. She'd have to put on weight. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I think that uh, brings us to the end of our time. Um, but uh, if anyone who's watching has more questions that we didn't get to answer, feel free to continue the discussion on Twitter or on our Mashable Reads Facebook page or on Goodreads. Uh, we'd love to keep talking about this book with you. Um, Paula, it was so great to talk to you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, thank you, Ellie, for joining us. Um, and I'm so glad we got to talk about this book. Um, thanks for tuning in, and stay tuned for the next announcement for the next Mashable Reads pick. <laughs>